between the brackets, I'm your own Coren. And my guests for this episode are Joseph Regal and Jackie Kerner, who are the co-editors of a new book, Wikipedia at 20, Stories of an Incomplete Revolution. Here it is. Um, Joseph is an associate professor of communication studies at Northeastern University, as well as the author of the books, Good Faith Collaboration, Reading the Comments, and Hacking Life. And Jackie is a qualitative research analyst for online communities and has also been a visiting scholar for the Wiki Education Foundation. Wikipedia at 20, and that's with, that's with an at sign, is a collection of 22 new essays about the history and future of Wikipedia on the occasion of its upcoming 20th birthday in January 2021. The essays are by a variety of people associated with Wikipedia in one way or another, including one each by Joseph and Jackie. And let me note that this is now the second episode in a row where I talk to authors or editors of a recent book. Last episode, I talked to Larry Sanger. So you might think that this has become a book show. It would be great if it did, actually, but no, it just turned out that way, mostly because there are at least, there are at least two books that have come out to be timed with the upcoming 20th anniversary of Wikipedia. That being said, if anyone's thinking of writing a book about MediaWiki or wikis or Wikipedia, please do that, and then I'll invite you on the show. Uh, anyway, jo Joseph and Jackie, it's great to have you here, and welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, uh, let's start with you. First, where are you located? I'm actually in uh, the middle of the U.S., so I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, so it's uh, in the middle of the mis Midwestern United States. Yes, I've been there. Yeah, been on the, uh, the, the border between East and West. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so you you write in the book about how you discovered uh, Wikipedia all the way back in two thousand one, mm -hmm. which is rare. Yeah. Uh, do you remember when you first thought, uh, you know, I can make this website a big focus of my professional life? That actually never occurred to me, to be honest. It never really occurred to me. Uh, most of the things I've been involved with, I'm like any any person with geek culture behind them it's you know it's something fascinating and then you're really attached to it um so i think really what happened was in my grad program um, my master's program i focused a large bit of my work on wikis not necessarily wikipedia but on wikis and the communication and the flexible nature um, and it was at a time where uh, we were switching at the university from um, different uh, web environments um, so a lot of people were um, locked down and locked out of editing the websites and the intranets and we had to really rely on the web team to do those sorts of things and I was suggesting that we move people into um, a more collective environment where people could really affect the change and that's something um, some people didn't take to they really were thinking oh that's not my that's not my part that's not my role and really trying to encourage people yeah that is your role that is absolutely anybody can do this and um, fast forward into later in my um, master's program, I was, um, I'd always argue about Wikipedia and how um, education is for everyone, where in my, um, in my final exams, my one uh, professor that highly disagreed with me about Wikipedia made it all about Wikipedia. Um, so in order huh. to pass, <laughs> in order to pass, I had to prove why education is a right and not a privilege. Um, so I did that, luckily, and um, then I went through my PhD program focusing on education equity and aspects of education. So it's it's not necessarily that it struck me as something that was going to be my profession, but it just really speaks to everything I stand for in my principles and uh, a lot of things that excite me. Yeah. Um, uh, Joseph, since you're at Northeastern University, I'm guessing you're in Boston right now? I am in Cambridge, where I live, and uh, yeah. yeah, I do teach in Boston. Um, you found a very interesting niche as a professor, which is analyzing the internet and communications around it. Yeah, I sometimes describe it as ambivalent studies, uh, focusing on geek communities. So I am often, as Jackie said, you get interested in these things and you get become attached after a while. And my initial enthusiasm is sometimes tempered by a little bit of concern or critical thinking about what it is that I'm engaged with. And so that was the case with Wikipedia, as well as online communities and commenting culture and then hacking life as well. I am kind of a life hackery type, um, but there are some things that we can point out as not necessarily being a good idea all the time, like injecting yourself with homemade uh, vaccines. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, that's not a result of reading Wikipedia. But uh, um, uh, yeah, it's interesting that you both po uh, point out the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the ambivalence, the, the good and the bad around uh, the internet. And I think that comes through in the book, um, uh, in both cases. Um, so, so this book, Wikipedia at twenty. Um, here it is again for people who are watching the video. Um, whose idea was it to have this collection of essays to celebrate or commemorate the 20th anniversary? I started with the idea because I'm really interested in history and my book Wikipedia uh, from 2010 about Wikipedia had a historical component. And back then I argued that Wikipedia was the fulfillment of a centuries old vision of a universal encyclopedia. And people had tried for many, many years, and Wikipedia, in a sense, finally succeeded. But then I was thinking, wow, we're approaching 20 years. How, ma how many things have changed, but how many things have stayed the same, too? So I thought it'd be really interesting to look back and see what has changed and what has stayed the same. Because uh, very often when people think about tech, they're always thinking about the future, or they're thinking about the latest, greatest, buzzworthy thing. And here we have an instance of an online platform, technology, and community that's been around for a while. And unlike its peers, like say Facebook or Google, which have also been around for a while, they've all basically become advertising companies. So Wikipedia is still right. actually trying to reach for its original mission. So I thought it'd be a really nice retrospective sort of project. And then with uh, Jackie's involvement, especially, we also began thinking about the future and making that a big component of the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, did, when did you first get the idea? I don't know. I think it was maybe two and a half, three years ago. And uh, yeah. I had worked with MIT Press on the Wikipedia book and a couple other of books. And we knew it was going to be a challenging project because the timeline would be very quick. And, right. uh, and we wanted to experiment with a technology that MIT Press had been working on called PubPub. So we did a call for participation and then brought in a, a bunch of essays and put them on PubPub, which allowed us to give feedback to one another. But PubPub, Pub, while I like it quite a lot, was also a bit of a moving target sometimes. Like when, right when we would come to something important, uh, like all the comments would disappear. <laughs> oh, <okay. And laughs> So that was a bit challenging. So it was a very challenging project and under a quick timeline, but I'm very proud that you're able to hold a copy in your hand now. And it is online as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I, I know putting any book together is a lot of work, but having to corral a whole bunch of people to write things is its own challenge. Uh, I, I, I have a little bit of experience with that. So, yeah, congratulations to you both for managing to pull it all together in time. Um, uh, yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned PubPub. Uh, they're, um, they're not just, you can see not just the essays there, but a bunch of essays that were written that didn't make it in. Um, it's a little tricky to find them, but I think I, I, I found and read most of them. Um, how did you both decide which essays to include and which not to? It was a really difficult process. Uh, we would have liked to have included all of them, but that was one of the, the tensions. Like Wikipedia is great because it doesn't have to worry about fitting in so many pages, <laughs> right? But right, the publisher right. said you have to fit in so many pages. So we had to make the really difficult decision and uh, the essays went out to external reviews and we had to weigh a whole bunch of things, including, you know, content, coverage, quality. But we're really happy that by using PubHub, we can keep all of the essays in draft form that were out there, as well as the most recent copy edited versions. Yeah, it was a real struggle. And like Joseph said, you know, the publisher said we had so much space. We even asked, can we have a little bit more? Or oh, what really? is the, yeah, we even massaged and tried to work with the different word counts. And said, okay, what accounts towards the word count? You know, does this count as well? And and so we were trying to, yeah. to work as hard as we could to fit as many as we could in there. But yeah, thank goodness for PubPub because otherwise, you know, the public wouldn't be able to see all the essays in their entirety. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, well, there's one essay specifically that I thought was interesting that didn't make it in by a guy named Pete Forsyth, uh, whom I've met. You, you may have met him too, but uh, um, I think it'd be interesting to a lot of people listening to this podcast because he talks about MediaWiki specifically and the features of it that he thinks let Wikipedia succeed where other similar projects have failed. Obviously, MediaWiki users aren't your main target audience, but um, 
uh, I think it's interesting to read. I'll link to it from the podcast page. Yeah, and one of the nice things in that we got the capability of licensing both the drafts and the final version under Creative Commons is authors were uh, able to do a lot with their essays. So one of the things that made it a little bit easier was, for instance, Pete's essay was published uh, external from the project, and he had every right and permission to do that. Oh, okay, okay. Where was it published? Do you know? I think I think it was something on Signpost. I see. Okay. So you can okay. find. So his piece was published on Signpost like six months ago, I think. Right. Okay. Cool. Um. So yeah, let's talk about what's in the book. Uh, uh, Joseph, you wrote the first essay in the book, which is called "The Many Reported Deaths of Wikipedia," uh, where you go into the history of all the people over the last. 20 years who said Wikipedia was going to fail. I thought it was worth reading just for reminding me about Google Null, which I had totally forgotten about. Um, but um, there's a there's a commonly stated joke, not really joke, but aphorism that uh, Wikipedia only works in practice and not in theory. Um, I think that's quoted at least once in the book, maybe in your chapter, maybe elsewhere. Um, I, I looked it up. Apparently, it's, it's by a guy named Gareth Owen. Anyway. Um, uh, that's what he claims. Uh, do 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 you agree with that? And and how big a part do you think that has played in people's thing uh, of Wikipedia? Yeah, I think sometimes it's also referred to as the zeroth law of Wikipedia. And I am interested in aphorisms, pop folk culture, ways in which people try to explain things. And when Wikipedia first came on the scene twenty years ago, uh, that's what most of the researchers were really focused on. Like, how the heck could something like this actually work? And I think the the research task for those first 10 years was coming to understand how something like that could work. So we also have an essay from Yokai Benkler, a professor at Harvard, who provided a lot of the theoretical basis for understanding some of these things in terms of crowdsourcing commons type phenomenon. Uh, right. I think of my original work as adding a cultural element of saying, I think the good faith culture here is really important. Um, Pete's essay that you mentioned, he was looking at some of the technology affordances as well. And I think the, the confusion around Wikipedia and the way it did work was frequently uh, a reason why people were originally skeptical. They didn't really understand how it worked. So, for example, the whole idea of crowdsourcing. Sometimes people argued that, well, Wikipedia is just this kind of chaos. It's the crowd. And I actually argue there are really important novel things happening in terms of so many people being able to collaborate. But my argument was, for example, that this is a specific community with a specific culture. People know one another when they've been editing for a long time. So it's a real mistake to overlook the culture, especially the good faith elements of the culture. Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Just, you know, just the fact that anyone can edit doesn't mean that it's literally everyone editing. Um, yeah, I agree. That's that's something that that, that uh, well, not the outsiders don't necessarily understand about Wikipedia. Um, one kind of ironic aspect to your essay is that there are few other essays in the book where people argue that Wikipedia is going to be dead in the future if certain things aren't changed. Whether it's because of Google reducing traffic to Wikipedia because it displays all the most important information right on their page, or because of harassment, uh, or maybe a few other things. Um, Obviously, the whole point of the book is to get a variety of different perspectives, but I wonder if you saw any irony in that. No, I, I was looking for productive conversations between the authors. I think Jackie and I both were. So we're working on a piece between two of the authors uh, that separate from the book, probably going to be published on a blog uh, soon associated with data, big data and society and social issues, uh, arguing as, as to whether things like Wikidata encapsulating information into abstract syntaxes uh, that can be translated across languages, whether that's a good thing or not. So there we're taking advantage of an essay from, let me see, Denny Vandrechek, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name. He worked on Wikidata and then sure, Wiki yeah. Abstract, and then uh, Heather Ford. So those two folks were in conversation, and we're going to have oh, a piece come out where they're kind of going back and forth, having a conversation about their various positions. So I didn't mind that people, you know, disagreed or or said different things in the book. I I liked that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Heather is the one who wrote the uh, 
the Google will kill Wikipedia essay, if I can, uh, you know, summarize it that way. Um, uh, kind kind of. I wouldn't summarize it quite that way. But fine. yeah, there there are some <laughs> there are some threats to Wikipedia, as there have always been. Uh, I have the benefit of being more historically inclined, as I'm. I rarely make predictions about the future, but I love to look at people's predictions about the future in hindsight. Um, right. So I end my piece by saying, I don't see Wikipedia dying anytime soon. Uh, and I don't think it will. It could certainly change. And that invites the whole question of what does it mean to die? What does it mean to change for a project like Wikipedia? And that's really the more interesting question that I think the latter third of the book is focused on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You mentioned Denny. And of course, if, if all of Wikipedia becomes automatically generated from, you know, a symbolic language or something, is it still Wikipedia? Or, you know, that's a open question, I guess. Um, uh, Jackie, how about you? Any thoughts on uh, how long Wikipedia has left? Well, that's the thing that like Joseph really was talking about. And this is something that was so wonderful about creating the book is how many wonderful conversations and encouraging debates that we all have that it's nothing is um, as combative as the recent U.S. election. It was all you were having these intellectual debates and, oh, that's an interesting point or, oh, I like what you said or, oh, wouldn't that be strange if that happened? You know, just all these conversations that we had developing these essays and with the authors was so wonderful. Um, but recognizing, OK, is Wikipedia's death really the death or is it just a rebirth, if if you will, into something you know, further and perhaps, you know, Wikipedia has died because the initial version, and it's really actually had many rebirths throughout this process. You know, we don't really know. It just depends on how you conceptualize it. Um, but it's been so interesting hearing uh, the different authors' perspectives about um, what needs to happen or what has happened or what's been meaningful to them. And I was actually thinking uh, over the weekend how interesting it is that we all are connected to Wikipedia, but for different reasons. You know, for me, it's about, you know, education and equity and uh, perhaps for someone else, it's the fascinating technology behind it. Or for someone else, it's um, a document of history. It's, it's all these different things. And so it's so fascinating to see what we all envision and what we all would like this to move to be. Um, but I, I think Wikipedia will be around for quite some time, whatever iteration it takes next. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Uh, you, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, knowledge equity. That's that's one of the big focuses of the book that I want to talk about. Uh, or as it's described in the book, it's, it seems more like knowledge inequity, really. Um, there are a lot of essays in the book talking about how Wikipedia has incomplete information, whether it's you know the usual not enough articles about women, not enough information about subjects relating to indigenous people, uh, not enough articles in languages other than English, and maybe 20 other languages. Um, and then there's more niche subjects that, that some people in the book say aren't covered enough, like black artists, trans activists, all this kind of stuff. And then, of course, all of that assumes that people can access the website in the first place. Uh, and of course, there are billions of people in the world who don't have Internet access at all. Uh, and there's, uh, I want to point out a really well-written chapter in the book by a guy named uh, Stéphane Coyer-Matillon. I hope that's how it goes. Uh, about the project to get Wikipedia into the hands of people who don't have an Internet connection. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's, there's, that's a lot of different topics. Uh, uh, language support has, has come up on this podcast before. Uh, uh, there's an essay there by Danny Vrandich, whom you mentioned, uh, Joseph, talking about the abstract Wikipedia project, which is now officially called Wikifunctions, and he was on this podcast talking about the same thing. Um, I want to ask about another semi-technical solution, uh, which is oral citations. Um, which uh, uh, there was a, a there were a surprising number of essays that at least talked about it. Um, uh, the idea is there's a lot of information from indigenous cultures that's never been written down. It's only available orally. So right now there's no way to get it into Wikipedia. Um, do either of you personally think there's a solution for that, technical or otherwise? I would hope there would be. Um, yeah. And I hope eventually, because there's so much critical information that we are denying validity because it's not documented in the way that we've normally or typically done it on Wikipedia. 
And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's not valid. It just means that it doesn't fit into our current um, our current policies and practices. So we need to work together to find ways to incorporate that, uh, whether it's um, technical, which I feel like technical probably will come after the policy uh, is accepting of these things. So I think that what we're riding up against is a lot of people don't find um, that oral histories have validity, um, at least the people who are arguing in these sorts of spheres. Uh, but I think there are plenty of people who find them valid. I mean, there are tons of libraries and museums, galleries that have oral history collections. Um, and it seems kind of funny that we wouldn't find oral histories to um, be relevant when um, libraries and museums have dedicated so much storage space for those. So we need to figure out some sort of solution. And it, I don't think it can be sent by any one person necessarily. Um, but I think that the policy will have to come and the technology can be um, developed after that policy change is accepted. All right. Yeah, I don't have uh, enough experience in this domain. It was one of the topics I was very much interested in, and I had hoped we had maybe would have gotten a chapter focusing specifically on or oral citations, but unfortunately that didn't happen. I see. But, but um, uh, the the project from 2011 by Achal Prapala, uh, you know, did make a really significant uh, attempt at improving the ability to incorporate oral citations into Wikipedia. But from a more historical point of view and cultural point of view, this is one of those intriguing dilemmas in that, you know, Wikipedia is so understandably uh, concerned with making sure that sources have verifiable sources that other people can verify. That's you know, such a big part of Wikipedia's uh, culture. And this is a challenge to that, and it's a really important challenge. And I don't think Wikipedia has managed to succeed to find a solution in this space. Um, so it's still an open question to me, one I, I'd like to actually think about more time permitting in the future. Yeah. Um, it seems like most of the other issues with knowledge equity have to do with what some people like to call systemic bias, uh, which if I understand it means that Wikipedia is mostly edited by white men living in the first world or, or whatever you want, when, whatever the first world is called these days. Uh, so most of the topics covered are ones that are of interest to that group. Uh, and Jackie, your essay is directly about that, as you can guess from the name, which is Wikipedia has a bias problem. Um, how big a problem do you think systemic bias is on Wikipedia? That's the tricky thing is that um, we'd have to measure it, but there again, there's, it can, it can be something that's that's a moving target, if you will, because we're all raised in this sort of environment where we are raised within the bias. We are we're steeped in it. We can't recognize it unless we step back and try to critically think about it. Um, so it impacts Wikipedia in ways that have not been uh, addressed. And actually, I had submitted two project grants. This is a bit sad and embarrassing, and um, uh, that had failed because um, I wanted to study bias and see. Um, see about bias on uh, English Wikipedia and then make a rep replicable study uh, for other language Wikipedias and projects. Um, so in that way, it could be a bit of a template to examine bias and uh, what's happening there. Um, but so far it hasn't taken um, because a lot of folks don't think that Wikipedia has a bias problem, uh, which is a bit humorous um, because it's, it's in everything that we do. And it's not necessarily that we're malicious in our intent to allow these systems um, to Wikipedia. It's just, you know, we don't know what we're doing and um, we need to figure out what we can do to make this as equitable as possible. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I do hope, I mean, yeah, the, the studies would be great. There does seem to be a, a, a scarcity of actual statistics or, or what have you about all, all these specific things that, that people are talking about. Um, uh, I, I want to talk about a few aspects of that, um, uh, partly because because it's such a big focus of the book, uh, and partly I just think it's interesting. But um, um, uh, uh, Jackie, your 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 uh, your essay takes kind of a somewhat contra somewhat confrontational tone uh, at, at times. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a story you tell uh, that I thought was worth talking about, uh, which is about real bias, I guess, and not just the systemic kind. Uh, 
so if I understand it correctly, you, you gave a talk at a Wikimania conference a few years ago about bias. And then at the end, during the question period, a guy got up and said that he had at some point corrected someone on Wikipedia for violating some guidelines. And then that person accused him of being biased because the other person was, well, we don't know, but female or a minority or both, presumably. Um, so then his question to you was, how should he make it clear that he's not biased? Uh, and your response to him was basically, yes, you are biased. Uh, and then in the book, you go further and say, not only is he biased, but he's, uh, and I quote, a white man abusing his power privilege. Yeah, and there's there's a bit more context I think that, that um, you're missing there, so maybe everyone could uh, read the essay a bit. But yeah, um, it was it was in a room, and it was basically um, this person was like, "Well, how can I tell them they're wrong uh, without being accused of bias?" And um, basically, this individual was wanting to follow policies uh, that were biased, and um, said that he was correcting this person who was not following the policies. And the person was basically saying these policies are are not allowing for equitable information to be included. I and see. So okay. this person, okay. yeah, so this person, um, the individual who was in the session said, how can I tell them they're wrong? It's like, well, they are wrong, I guess, according to the policy, but do we want to continue to perpetuate this and this situation? And so he basically was saying, well, how can I tell them they're wrong? It's like, but maybe you need to be reflective. So I think that in society in general, uh, it's very easy to say, oh, that person cut me off and in traffic instead of stopping and saying, all right, wait, was were there something I was doing? Maybe I didn't see them signal and I didn't let them in. You know, instead of looking at our own behaviors, we're very quick to, to point and look at other people's behaviors. Uh, so in that room uh, in at Wikimania, we were all trying to encourage this person and being very supportive, saying, look here, can you, you know, turn it on its side and look at it this way? Can you look at it this way? And the person was was um, so conflicted by this that they followed me around the rest of the conference. And I wasn't upset by it, but several other people were upset by his insistence in um, speaking with me throughout the entire conference that they had actually reported it to the trust and safety individuals. And they said, this is this person keeps, you know, hounding Jackie. And I said, you know, I'm fine because this person's struggling through something. They're trying to have a conversation and and sometimes when we're when we're in change, the the change is difficult, and it's these conversations are not easy. And um, you know, even Joseph and I had some meaningful conversations where we're we're talking about okay, how much do we want to have in this book? Is it going to be too uncomfortable for people? Or do we need to 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 change the language so it's going to be more digestible for people? Because sometimes things can feel confrontational. So my essay might feel confrontational for some people who are still um, going through some of these experiences or still um, trying to figure out some of these experiences. So it can feel confrontational in that way, whereas other people who are already steeped in this work and they're saying, oh yes, this essay, this, this says everything I feel and this, is, uh, this puts it out there. Um, so it's, it's very different experience, I think, for different in individuals who would read it. Um, but I think that's very interesting that we need to encourage ourselves to look at our own behaviors and how we're impacting uh, bias on Wikipedia instead of considering other people's behaviors as much. Sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, I definitely uh, believe uh, in, in having um, you, showing more empathy, especially in, in you know, text based conversations where where um, uh, things can really get easily get magnified and, and right. spiral out of control. Um, I, it just, it seems to me like it, it, um, it would have been better to just focus on the specific actions. And I, again, I don't know what, 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 what exactly was said on Wikipedia and so forth, but uh, um, it seems counterproductive to, to, focus, to, to, to focus on the guy's, you know, demographic attributes. Because, uh, you know, if he... It, from his perspective, he's being perfectly valid, you know, in enforcing the guidelines. I mean, obviously, no one person can change the guidelines. Um, I don't know. I get. I mean, I, I, again, I, I think it's a it, it's a, an issue of empathy going the other way. Is you know, you know, you have to be empathetic to the the non empathetic people as well. I suppose. Well, I, I, think, I think it's also again looking at the person and considering behavior because we can't change. Um, other people's actions, we can only be responsible and change our own behaviors. 
So, um, you know, I guess we're just have to agree to disagree here. Um, because I think that pointing, <laughs> pointing out um, his demographic is highly important here because um, living in a world as a um, person who is not um, the person of privilege in a lot of places, I am a person of privilege, but in some places I'm not. And um, on Wikipedia, I write that line that I have privilege, but I also don't have that privilege because I am arguing for things that go against policies. So a lot of times um, these groups and cabals will come together and say, oh no, this is the policy. It needs to stay the same instead of saying, you know, what's going on with this policy? Let's talk about it. How is it not working for this group of people? Tell me about that. Let's work together to, to develop that instead of that openness. It's, nope, this is the policy. You're not following the policy. You need to leave. And it's just shut down instead of coming in as a, an empathetic welcoming aspect and saying, you know, this policy, you're right, does seem to exclude some folks. Sure, I agree, yeah, and, and there's there's nothing worse, well, there are a lot of things worse, but it's it's bad when, uh, you know, when, when people on Wikipedia uh, just revert someone with a string of acronyms and, you know, just assume, assume that that's the, the argument ender and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, but I mean, you don't. There's no way to know who the the people are. I mean, there could be within that cabal minorities and and women, presumably, and I, unless you, I mean, unless that's not the case, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm just saying uh, the actions can be separate from the uh, the 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 people, the uh, demographics of the people. Well, because yes. the, the demographics yeah. shape shape the content in Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So something I worked on a long time ago, I might have been one of the first folks to actually do a content analysis of Wikipedia related to gender. And so, for example, I compared how many articles Wikipedia had on women to Encyclopedia Britannica. And in subsequent work, I began to look at ideas like openness and freedom, as in like free software. And in that work, I identified the ways that the people who are at the table very much are able to define what is considered worthwhile, what is considered knowing, and who should be invited to participate. And so de demographics, I think you might be speaking from a point of view of um, maybe colorblindness or demographic blindness. Um, and that might be a future that we would like to get towards. But if you have a, a group of people who are interested in, for instance, a very geeky thing, nothing wrong with this. I really liked Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but you know, every episode, every 144 episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer has an article. But uh, conversely, <laughs> uh, but conversely, you know, there are notable women who have been nominated for Nobel Prizes or who are running for candidate seats this uh, year who did not have articles. And so those questions about uh, notability come up and mm -hmm. it is nice to be able to argue about notability in an abstract sense but when you look at the bias that is present in Wikipedia a lot of it I think you can attribute to who is there and what they find interesting and that is very much related to demographics oh sure no I, I mean I, I can't dispute that I, I wouldn't have the information to dispute even, even if I could but it but it, even if I want to but it makes sense um, uh, yeah, I just think uh, it, when you're talking about specific editors, I, I don't, I don't think it's helpful. I think it just adds more heat to the fire, I guess, to to talk about uh, specific editors, uh, demographic groups, and you know, uh, view them within that prism. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, this uh, well, well, that that's more of a, of a minor note. The, the the what you're getting at with systemic bias is is a bigger uh, topic in the book, and and I want to talk about that too. Um, you pointed out some examples, and I think uh, to some extent the, those examples are mentioned in the book um, uh, of uh, of a, a real or perceived uh, anti-female bias, which I guess you could call sexism or systemic sexism or, or whatever it is. Um, uh, people point out that uh, the editors of Wikipedia may be only 10% female, that's hard to tell, uh, and in, in the articles on Wikipedia that are about people, 18% uh, of those are women. I don't know if that's English language or all of them. Um, um, I'm guessing you'd both think the ideal percentage of female editors is 50%. Uh, 
that maybe goes without saying. What what about the ideal percentage of articles about people? Uh, if there were no bias in Wikipedia, what percentage of articles about people would be about women? Do either of you have any specific number, you know, goal number in mind? Well, in one of my articles about uh, biases in various communities, especially free culture and open source type communities, is I would not say there should be a uh, a threshold, a quota, like Wikipedia should be 50% women. Um, I think it probably should be higher. And I think uh, people have different degrees of interests. And so for instance, I, in my work on this, I pull from the literature on computer science. And you can see that 30, 40% of the students in the 1980s interested in computer science are women. And then it started going down and dropping and dropping and dropping until it became quite small. And then with some activities in, in terms of challenging the demographic of what makes a good computer science student, some computer science programs have been able to elevate that number. And so I don't think it's sufficient to say uh, everything is open and everything is free and the people who are editing or contributing or taking computer science courses or doing something technical is a reflection of the genuine interest out there. We know there are systemic issues and we know those numbers can go up and down based on the context, based on how those domains are perceived. And so I would never say it should be 50%, but I know it could be higher. And I would like to see it get higher because I think that actually uh, the, the notion of equity there not only concludes a sense of fairness, but also in a sense of improved quality, that the content is going to be better. No, uh, I, can, I can kind of play off of that a little bit. Um, and that's that's something that, you know, saying it's 50-50, that's, I don't think, a very um, in-depth perspective on this because that, you know, there again, things are going to flex and change a bit depending on the field, depending on the area. Um, but if you just look at, for example, college enrollment, it's actually higher um, percentage is women. And so you have right. actually 60, 40 and going on just generic figures. Of course, that depends on different institutions and areas. Um, but then if you go on that perspective that, you know, 60 percent of women are in school and should be doing cool and awesome things and maybe 60 percent of pages should be about women. But that's not necessarily a fair thing to say either. So it's. I think it's more nuanced than that. And I'm with Joseph. I'd like to like it to see the the amount to be higher. And there again, you know, it's going to be dependent on each individual um, area, and not just necessarily about um, you know pages about women. Kind of going back to what Joseph was saying about Buffy. It's kind of funny. There's all these episodes, you know, which Buffy's awesome. It's great. But you know why do we have all these pages out here? It was it was meaningful to somebody to write, take the time to write all that, to source all that information. But why isn't as meaningful to post about women who are doing awesome things in science, awesome things in um, computer science, awesome awesome things in um, you know medicine right now, or even just awesome things in regards to um, research on emotional living right now through this pandemic. Um, all sorts of things that are not necessarily um, appealing to uh, the demographic who often writes Wikipedia that that definitely need to be out there because people and we need to recognize that it's not just people who are creating Wikipedia but people who are reading Wikipedia are important as well. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, this gets to something I, I was wondering about that I, I don't think is ever um, uh, I don't think anyone ever uh, clarifies uh, their view on this in the book, so so I, I really want to ask about it now. Um, you mentioned, you know, art uh, trivial articles or articles about seemingly trivial things like uh, Buffy the the Vampire Slayer episodes or whatever. Um, uh, when when you when you talk about that, it's uh, where, or when other people in the book talk about that kind of thing uh, and contrast it and use percentages, it's never clear whether they think Wikipedia would be improved if there were fewer articles or fewer content about those trivial things or about men or whatever it is, or uh, if if uh, if it would just be better to have more articles about the other stuff. I, I, I think to me that 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 that's that that makes me uneasy about the use of percentages, even though it's a good metric. It it can still make it seem like 
um, whether you're talking about editors or articles or anything else, that that reducing some of these things uh, would would uh, actually improve Wikipedia. Uh, do either of you have thoughts on that? I tend towards being an inclusionist, and I know that's not very common anymore. And I know it's a difficult position to maintain. Um, uh, a while back, at the tenth year anniversary. Uh, a old database of Wikipedia's first contributions, which had thought to be had been lost, uh, had been rediscovered. And something I did is I edited, I created a Wikipedia kind of site. It's just a web, but like hundreds of web pages of the first 10,000 edits to Wikipedia. And if you Google like Wikipedia 10K Redux, you can find that from 10 years ago. And you can look at how easy it was to edit content. And you can also see yeah. the bias in the original editors. There were hundreds of articles about Ayn Rand and objectivism. And, you right, know, that right. shows that Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger were interested in, in objectivist philosophy. And they brought some friends over for the, from the mailing list they were on. Um, and to see that, you know, shows that there is that interesting history. And that it used to be so easy to create all kinds of articles about all kinds of things. And one, and one of the things I liked about this project was realizing that there's these inversions, how some things flipped. So Wikipedia went from being extremely promiscuous and inclusionist to very deletionist now, or exclusionist. And I understand why. The more articles there are, the more harder it is for the hardcore Wikipedians who do a lot of the maintenance to maintain it. So the people who stick around the longest, I can see them seeing an article that doesn't seem like the greatest article, or maybe it's not the most notable thing, and thinking, oh, this article, I'm going to have to put it on my watch list. I'm going to have to keep it from being vandalized. So I know there's a cost to an inclusionist philosophy, but nonetheless, I tend to lean that way. So I would like to see more articles. I would like to see a little bit more of that original spirit than is currently the place. But I say that fully knowing all the challenges associated with that. So, you know, coming up with a sense of what is reputable and understanding that there's a maintenance um, cost out there with the more articles that you have. And I'm going to touch that with Joseph on this. I think we're both inclusionists. And I think that's, um, you can kind of see that perspective throughout the book that we really um, encouraged people to talk about, you know, what's important to them, what's critical to them and their um, aspects, especially in part three, um, comes very evident um, in talking about different things about authorship um, and why it's critical to them. And so going back to um, Joseph's Buffy example for, uh, for a moment, it's, it's not that we need to delete these, these instances of pop culture that were important and are important to individuals. It's that we need to consider what are we missing? What else is out there that we are just missing because of blind spots that we may have created in our policies, our practices, or just our own individual perspectives? And I think that um, it's, it is important to recognize that there is a cost. Joseph's right. There is a cost to including everything. And I think that it's difficult because we've relied a bit too much on um, volunteer expertise and, and volunteer um enthusiasm and not recognize the burnout that is a possibility, a very, very large possibility within the community. And we need to work to mitigate those things. But I don't think that those are things that are insurmountable in these situations that, you know, I don't think we should say, okay, we have to do this because this isn't a possibility now. We should say, all right, how can we work to be more inclusive? How can we work to include this content? Because obviously this was important to someone. Now, uh, now, of course, there's going yeah. to be the high schoolers out there and just getting silly one day and writing some nonsense. And, of course, that's, that gets exhausting seeing day in and day out. Yeah. Um, but um, you have people who are writing, um, for example, um, Sonny Wolf was an article I started a couple of years ago uh, when she just passed away. And she was actually one of the founders of the Dykes and Bikes Um rally in san francisco and it wasn't until one year later that someone's like oh yeah she is valid and it's like wait wait, wait. you know it's, it took a whole year for that to happen and so at the time i didn't have um the energy or the time to dedicate to um making that page stick um but it took a whole year and the page came back around which was great but that means there was a whole year that that content wasn't out there 
for people to observe and study. And there was actually um, large Supreme Court cases talking about freedom of speech and expression that Sonny Wolf had uh, worked with. And those were critical, but people couldn't access that information because of, you know, the person who was patrolling said, no, this person's not valid. Instead of reaching out and saying, hey, what's going on with this person? And I know that takes energy and that takes a lot of time and that's a lot to put on volunteers. But I think that we need to have that perspective of including and saying, why is this information important to someone? Why would someone take the time to put this out here? Why does this person want this information shared? And really just take a step back instead of looking at it from our own lenses, um, because we are only, um, we're only educated from our perspective. And that again, goes to, goes back to what I was saying earlier about bias. And we can't know what we don't know until we try to challenge ourselves to know more. Um, so really it's important to think back to um, what we want out of Wikipedia and go back to those principles from the early days. What is this that we're doing? You know, what are we trying to get to? Right. You know. um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and uh, obviously the whole question on Wikipedia is it's just a whole topic in and of itself. Um, uh, uh, I guess I, I, not, I guess I'm belaboring the point, but I, I want to go back to my uh, uh, question about um, uh, about you know the the use of comparisons and percentages. Uh, um, I wonder if potentially there's there's a, there's there are metrics that are that are more that are uh, that give less of uh, I don't know. That are less relative. That uh, that that give less of the sense that uh, there's too much of any one thing, and, and are, are more um, more absolute or more rigorous or something. And maybe and Jackie, maybe this is something that you wanted to get at with your uh, with your planned uh, project. I, I don't know. Yeah, and this is this is something that yeah I can absolutely speak to, and I don't think that the individuals utilizing these percentages are saying um, these shouldn't exist. I think they're saying. Well, look, there's a big disparity here. Someone pay attention to this disparity um, that if we can write about these things, shouldn't we, like I was saying a minute ago, shouldn't we also be writing about this really cool, awesome person doing this amazing thing? You know, if these if these are out here, why can't these also be out here? And it's it's not necessarily a call to delete those other things. It's a call to include more. It's a call to examine what's happening that we aren't addressing these issues. What's happening that we aren't including these really awesome, cool people who are doing amazing things? You know, what what is happening in our institution that we've created that's excluding? Yeah, I study pop culture, and I certainly don't want to lose those Buffy articles. Uh, but, you know, this is one of the challenges with voluntary sort of work. But when we stop thinking necessarily, if if we stop being constrained in our thinking about what is possible now with what we have now and the resources we have now, it allows you to take a broader view. So for example, Jackie has been involved with the 2030 project, like trying to envision what Wikipedia would be without the, the blinders of necessarily what it is now and what it's been in the past. So we also have a capstone from the executive director from the Wikimedia Foundation talking about some of this stuff. And a lot of the contributors uh, have received some support from the Wikimedia Foundation in terms of little grants to have edit-a-thons, for instance, by focusing on black artists or uh, women biographies. And if you only thought we're only a volunteer, voluntary community and we don't need to give any support to anyone, um, you, would be in, you wouldn't have considered that as a possibility. But if you look towards the future and if you say it would be really nice to have content on stuff that isn't our, in our current editor's immediate interest, like the interstate system. People love the interstate system and there's hundreds of articles on the road system in America. But if we can envision what we would like to see Wikipedia be, then what do we do to get there? And that's just a different way of thinking that a lot of uh, people don't necessarily consider. They just think about what have we been and where are we now? And, you, and it is useful to think about the future. So when I first thought about the book, I wasn't thinking about that because I have historical fondness. I was really interested in what insights we can gather from hindsight. But I do think, it, I, I mean, Jackie makes a really compelling argument that we should think about the future and what we would like Wikipedia to be. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, personally, I would, I would love to see uh, some massive uh, you know, the a thousand or ten thousand articles that are missing on Wikipedia that would be uh, that someone should add. Uh, you know, whether compiled by some someone, some committee or set of experts or something. I think a, a lot of people uh, could, a lot of volunteers uh, could might uh, might view that as as a, a challenge or an opportunity to add stuff that's. Uh, useful. I don't know. I don't think there's a master list, but a lot of the, the projects out there certainly have, uh, you know, the women in red, right? These are articles about women that are currently red links and could be uh, improved. Yeah. And Joseph, yeah. help me out. Do you remember, I can't remember the tool um, that was created, that was written about, was in Wired, um, that you, that they had basically a list of articles and they created um, stubs. What was that? I'm blanking right now. I, of course, can send it Oh, out. one of those. Uh... Um, but it's a tool, but they have a list as well. Um, that they, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. They basically, it's it's um, it's an automated. It's basically, um, you know, crawls the, the internet and found good sources and created a stub. And then, so, you know, someone can click and then utilize that um, stub for further. I have it in my bookmarks, but of course, my bookmarks oh, okay. in the Wikipedia folder is terrible. <laughs> it's so big. Um, yeah, one of the, when I... When I work with my students to develop Wikipedia articles, because that's a big part of a capstone project I class I teach, uh, one of the most challenging things, uh, you know, the technical stuff, particularly if they have to look at the wiki syntax, and again, that's one of those interesting inversions. Wiki syntax was written to be really, really easy and approachable, and now the wiki syntax <laughs> is very, very difficult. But right. then on top of that, we have the um, we have the easy visual editor, right, which is great. But ironically, one of the things that the visual editor has led to was even more complicated wiki syntax. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so I'm really interested in those kind of changes, these inversions, these flip flops back and forth. Um, but when I have my students uh, work, one of the most challenging things is for them to find an article that they'd like to work on, uh, sometimes extend, but more often than not create on their own. And there are some really nice resources out there. There's uh, most you can. Re there's a whole page dedicated to listing articles that you would like, and you can include some sources. There's another source whereby uh, it's the most clicked on red links. So there is a lot of oh, stuff okay. out there. Yeah. And then yeah. of course the various wiki projects and like Black Lunch Table and Art and Feminism, they've compiled big lists for their various editathons. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jackie, if you think of the the name of that uh, tool anytime between now and when this episode airs, I can put it yeah, on the... Uh, I actually found yeah. it. It's oh, okay. um, Quicksilver, which I should remember that because I'm a Mac user. You'd think it'd be... Sorry. Oh, anyway, okay. um, Quicksilver. Um, yeah. And it's actually, if you... Uh, I'll send you the, the link um, to it, but it's actually very interesting. Um, that there's There are lists all over, but like Joseph said, you know, Women in Red... Um, yeah. there's, there are lists all over that people could just seek out, you know, or even just posting on the top page and say, look, what's the top five that you all would like to see, you know, and then just over, you know, the, the winter months and people are indoors or, you know, during someone's rainy season or whatnot, when they're trying to hide out from the rain or, you know, waiting for the, for the Metro, something like that, you know, just start, yeah. a, start a stub, start, start working on something you know develop something together um yeah there's ton there are tons of lists out there and tons of opportunities but this was a neat tool that i thought um really gave people a jumping off point especially for folks who are just instant writers blocked like okay how do i get started this is a great tool to get people started yeah yeah cool um one of you mentioned that the 22 i think uh, joseph you mentioned the, the 2035 project i've heard of the 2030 project but not the, maybe i had it wrong what is oh, it? Okay. Jackie's, maybe, maybe Jackie's, Jackie's the expert on that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe there will be a 2035 too, because we'll have more, more great stuff to do. Sure, I hope so. I mean, after 2030, there's going to be something. <laughs> right. Else. Right. There's got to be beyond, right? <laughs> um, so um, uh, moving on from bias and inequity, um, uh, there are a lot of other topics covered in the book, of course, uh, but it doesn't really make sense to go through all of them. Um, so I wanted to try to end on a more hopeful note. Uh, Wikipedia is considered by a lot of people to be the, the, the single greatest success story of the internet. Um, but uh, as with a lot of the digital things, it can be hard to see the actual effects of it uh, in the real world. I wonder if either of you have any kind of story or observation about 
the impact that the existence of Wikipedia has had. Uh, Joseph, I'll, I'll start with you. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Okay, so going back to that notion of the flip-flops that you see in history and in the versions, the inversions, uh, Wikipedia's role in education, I think, has been a really interesting inversion. A number of the authors uh, of the collection note that when we were younger, be it an undergrad or grad, we did get you know a fair amount of hassle for being interested in Wikipedia as a research topic. None of us said, you know, uh, we want to use Wikipedia as a you know, as a primary source, uh, but even its legitimacy as something to be interested in. And now as teachers, whether you should use Wikipedia in the classroom or not, Alexandra Lockett wrote a really nice essay in the book, and she noted that her students have never lived in a world without Wikipedia. <laughs> and that's just mind-blowing to someone older that, like me, who originally saw Wikipedia as this amazing new thing that the uh, crusty authorities were shaking their fists at. Um, so I don't know if that speaks to your question, but I'll let Jackie follow up with maybe something that comes to her mind. But I think the role of education is 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 a big one. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and that's that's a bit of a funny thing. I'll go back to that because that quote keeps coming up, and and um, Alexandria Lockett, she's you know wonderful um, in the work that she's doing um, regarding authorship, and it's it's it was really amazing to think that wow, you're right all the students that we're teaching in the classroom now, they don't know. And that, that hurt my body a little bit. Cause I'm like, wow, I, <laughs> I'm starting to feel old a little bit here. <laughs> um, but I think that there's a huge part of education. And actually I love um, aspects uh, documenting events. That's something that's always been very fascinating to me is hearing people who have focused on the news aspect and evolving events, um, documenting that on Wikipedia and the nature of, um, collectively coming together to document information, not just for um, pop culture or news or awareness, but safety for the individuals involved in that, that that's been fascinating that seeing that sort of humanity come together. So I guess just in general, the humanity aspect of it, that's something that's just totally fascinating to me uh, throughout my experience with Wikipedia and hopefully uh, will develop as a, as a connection further as we keep going um, into this is just recognizing our humanity together and hearing each other in, in better ways than uh, we have understood Wikipedia to mean. It's not just an information um, avenue. We don't just provide and receive and um, consume information, but you know we're coming together to collectively solve problems and influence each other in better ways. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Does that get it? Get it? What yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very in inspiring, and uh, yeah, and I, I mean, there's, I've, I, I know there's a lot of uh, Wikipedia editors who whose social life and uh, and and uh, career path and all of that have been affected quite uh, dramatically, positively, hopefully, for the, uh, by uh, by their involvement with Wikipedia. And that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight in the work. Uh, it wasn't, again, it was an unusual and difficult project. And one of the things that is also novel is that it came from MIT Press. And most of the time when you think of a collection from an academic publisher, it's basically a bunch of research papers. And we really wanted yeah. people to reflect on their relationship to Wikipedia, their personal relationship. So a lot of people were able to place themselves as people interested in Wikipedia, as Wikipedians in a context. And it's one of my favorite things about the book, and it, it's not what you might expect when you first encounter it. Yeah, yeah, I want to ask about that too. There's a lot of what, like, what I guess in the academic world would be called, uh, eth what is it, ethno- Auto-ethnography. Auto -anthropology what is it? Ed Auto-ethnography. Auto-ethnography, right, uh -huh. right. Yeah, we never use that particular term, but these are research reports, they're essays. And they're essays reflecting on both, you know, what, what have we learned in the past 20 years and also what might we do or become in the next 20 years yeah. yeah i think these might be more personal narratives i guess is is maybe what we're what we're going for here um and and a lot of people they they infuse their own experiences and perspectives and i think that that's what makes this at least for me what made this project so exciting is getting to engage with so many different people and their different perspectives and see what wikipedia meant to them and what means to them and and what we can do together to go forward and so many 
brilliant people. And this is the thing too, that's so critical about this book is that we didn't just get, you know, certain groups of people from a certain, um, collected group. We had, um, Joseph put out there, uh, a call for participation and it was amazing. The depth and breadth of the essays that were received. And I just was continue continually blown away um, by the individuals, and I'm so glad to have made connections with those individuals and um, learning about their work in further areas. It just is, it's really a unique collection, and I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to work on this, as well as to have this book be published and out there for individuals, because I think that a lot of times um, technical books can be a little bit um, focused about Wikipedia and uh, it's not engaging to individuals who might be interested, whereas this book can be inter interesting to people who are technical, to people who are on the social aspects, to people who have not really been involved with Wikipedia before. It's, it's everyone can find something in this book and really connect with the individuals who are very real and very open uh, about their work and about their experiences in this book. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a great historical record too. Mm -hmm. um, for, for you know future scholars and the like um, well great that's a that's a that's a great note to end this on um, uh, yeah uh, the the book is Wikipedia at 20 stories of an incomplete revolution it's a great holiday gift for uh, for the the Wikipedia enthusiast or uh, or um, user which I guess is all of us at this point in your life uh, and uh, thanks to both of you, Jackie and Joseph, for being on podcast. Thank you, Yaron.